Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Book Store Remote. I'm Elizabeth, the events coordinator from Gibson's, and I am very pleased to welcome tonight Catherine M. Valenti. Uh, Catherine has quite a resume, so I'll just read some of this. A New York Times bestselling author of over two dozen works of fiction and poetry. Uh, you've probably read some of them. The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making, Radiance, Deathless, uh, so many awards. Andre Norton, Tip Tree, Sturgeon, UG Foster Memorial, oh, the Lambda, the Locust, the Hugo, the Pre, Imaginalis. You have been a finalist for the Nebula and World Fantasy Awards. You live in a tiny island off the coast of Maine with a small but growing menagerie of beasts, some of which are human. We might see one of the four-legged ones tonight, <laughs> uh, the Void Kitty. We are so pleased to have you here tonight as you discuss uh, your, this is a bit of a pre-launch event now because mm. if, if you have been living under a rock, you may not yet be aware that there are supply chain issues this year with books. I believe Europe ran out of paper at their printing presses this week. Um, so this book is now a pre-launch. This event is now a pre-launch for Comfort Me with Apples, which means that there is still time for you to pre-order your copy from Gibson's. We will have signed book plates. We are very pleased that they'll be coming in shortly. Um, that was a that was a long introduction. Thank you for joining <laughs> us this evening. Thank you for having me. Um, so, I, wish, I mean, I wish this was our launch event, but you know, we're we're doing the best we can, and it's it's actually I feel like the getting used to virtual events over the last year actually has really suited. Now that we've leapt into supply chain issues, now yeah. It, the, the publicist was like, oh no, the books are delayed. I'm like, that's fine. That's fine. We're just going to keep going. We're going to keep having the event. Um, it's just people will get their books just a little bit later. Uh, to with, I do want to tell our audience members, feel free to throw questions into the Q&A panel or into the chat box. Um, make sure your settings are set to everyone for the audience to converse with each other. Um, we will be, if you got a good one, we're going to be throwing it in right in the middle of the event, but we will be answering questions uh, at the end of the event. Um, but let's talk about the book, Comfort Me yeah. with Apples. I want to ask where that name came from, yeah. but also tell me, just tell me, tell us a bit about the book. Yeah, so um, it's the hardest book to market I've ever had uh, because it's got this massive sort of twist, like six, sixth sense level twist. So we can't just be like, oh, you know, he was dead all along. Uh, and we, That's not the twist. That. That's not the no, twist. No, no, that has nothing to do with that. <laughs> but um, we've been like trying to talk people into reading this book without actually telling them what it's about. Um, but what I can tell you is uh, that it is about a woman named Sophia who lives in a profoundly gated community with the world's worst homeowners association bylaws uh, hanging over her head. Um, she is the perfect housewife, uh, the perfect wife, the perfect uh, neighbor, and is is wholly fulfilled by that. She she lives in her privileged bliss. And one day uh, after she is clearing up after dinner, she discovers a um, human fingertip bone in her knife block uh, and sort of goes down the rabbit hole of how it got there and who she is actually married to and uh, discovering the truth of, of her world. That's horrifying. There's something about a fingertip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not, I mean, it's just not an accident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it is speculative. It, it's, it's a murder thriller, but uh, it is, it is a fantastical story. I just can't tell you how it's fantastical in, in a very sort of Stepford Wivesy way. That is the twist. Um, but if you enjoy science fiction and fantasy, but also your murder shows and murder podcasts, as I do, uh, this is definitely the book for you. Excellent. Well, I believe you, that sets the scene for us. Do you have a little bit of a reading yeah. that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think the best is to just start at the beginning. Okay. Um, and I, there, each chapter begins with um, some of the bylaws of the uh, Homeowners Association, but I will skip that uh, to just read um, the beginning of Sophia's uh, point of view. <sighs> I was made for him. It is morning, which is to say it is the beginning of all things. 
It is bright and it is sharp and it is perfect. And so is Sophia, who wakes alone to this singular thought as she does every morning, to this honeyed liquid thought and the sunlight and sparrow song and the softness of green shadows in a house that is far too big for her. Not that she complains, ah, oh, no, not Sophia, in whom the organ of dissatisfaction was somehow absent from birth. Her husband spoils her and she is grateful, but she never needed anything so grand. None of the other houses on their street are half as luxurious or inspiring. And it is a long street, very long and very fine. Sophia runs her hand over the place beside her where her husband so rarely sleeps these days and thinks it again with as much joy. I was made for him. She moves in this echoing house like a flicker of goldfish in the depthless trenches of the sea. Her long hair, bright and fine as cherry bark, snakes through a mountain of pillows. The dawn comes dancing in as gold as you please through vast cross-hatched windows curtained in tapestries. Her bedside candle has burned down through the small hours to a thick, craggy nub. Her colorful blanket, still smooth and neat for Sophia, has never had an anxious dream in all the deep violet nights of her life. Streams away from her in all directions, a vast, peaceful province peopled by intricate, embroidered roses, tatted lace peonies, quilted moonflowers, trailing ribbon-stitched clover and the little cliffs and hollows of Sophia's rich body beneath the dawn. Even the bed is so much bigger than she could ever need, especially since she sleeps alone more nights than not. Her husband has important work and it never ends. Even when he is with her, he is always on call. Sophia does not mind. She's never minded. She keeps her own company very snugly and very well. There is something decadent in having this sea of silk and wool and wood all to herself, sailing it into the unconquered country of her sleep like a pilgrim of the night. It feels like getting away with something to have so much. Getting out of bed is something of a mountaineering expedition. Her husband made her a little staircase down from the mattress to the floor, so the delicate bones of her ankles never once get jangled. Sophia flexes her flat golden brown stomach and swings herself over the side, her smooth feet hitting the top stair with a satisfying sound, like a cup setting into its saucer. She fetches her robe from a great brass hook in the wall. It is the color of earth before planting. It shines with quality. She knots the sash around her strong waist. It's too big for her. She drowns deliciously inside it. She does not need a robe. It's warm here and she has nothing to hide, but she enjoys the slippery kiss of it against her skin all the same. Like everything else, it was a gift from him to her. The world flows in that direction. Him to her, a river of forever. She sits down at a huge vanity, so big she must pile up throw pillows on the seat just to see herself in the wide mirror, a polished oval glass ringed in carved wooden branches bearing figs and plums. Sophia's never been one for too much makeup. Scrubbed skin and hair is more than enough, her husband always says. But a little color in the cheek never hurt anyone. He never needs to know. If he thinks a woman wakes in the morning with shimmering eyes and a perfect pout, well, let him. She ties her hair back with a white ribbon, stark as bare bone against her thick brown hair. Outside the windows, finches and starlings and lorikeets warm up for their daily concert in the park. Sophia's long, clever fingers pull at the crystal knob on the vanity's top right-hand drawer. The thrill of pleasure in this thing done each day for herself and herself alone, she takes out her little secret luxuries. A bronze compact with a puff neatly tucked inside, three slender brushes tipped with soft tufts of rabbit fur, and three small matching pots, clay for cold cream, silver for rouge, gold for eyeliner. Kindly old Mrs. Orpington tucked them into her grocery basket next to the sweet potatoes and the eggs and the new butter. Her neighbors are always looking out for her that way. Shy little treats, shy little smiles, shy little waves from down the road. 
Sophia paints herself slowly, subtly. Every sweet sweep of rabbit bristles against her skin is electric as a summer storm. Today, as she does every day, Sophia will descend the grand staircase into the house. It takes some time. The teak steps rise so steep and tall she must perch on the lips of them like a child, stretching her legs down to brush the top of the next one, and only then scoot down safely, and repeat and repeat and repeat until her toes finally find relief on the parquet floor. Her man carved each of the 28 stairs round the edges with a million detailed leaves she must polish, plus the round silver moons that crown the banisters once a week. But today is not polishing day. She needn't give one thought to the leaves and the moons. No, today Sophia will clean the rest of the house. She imagines herself doing it before she begins each task unfolding in her tidy mind as perfectly as a letter to herself. She will sweep the floors with a heavy oak broom. Then she will scrub them with lemon water and good lavender soap she makes herself in the second guest bathroom, so that the smell of lye will not trouble her mist. Only until the basement is finished, then she will have room to spread out. But until then, and Sophia is not allowed in the cellar. It's dangerous, he tells her. So much old equipment lying around. She could get hurt. Sophia doesn't ever want to get hurt or set one single soft foot where she is not allowed. What a thing to even imagine, just going right into a place he specifically told her wasn't safe. She excises this paradox from her thoughts and replaces it with a pleasant anticipation of how lovely the cellar will be when he does finish it. How convenient and enjoyable she will soon find it to make all her little treasures in a space built just for her. After the floors, Sophia will beat the curtains and the rugs until the dust motes twinkle like stars in the thick, warm air. She will collect her husband's things from the sofas and the armchairs on the floor. It is laundry day, so she will wash the linens and the bath towels and pin them up to dry from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. exactly. Then she will rinse the breakfast dishes, arrange the flowers from the garden on the table where her husband will see them as soon as he comes home. Orange roses. For tonight, she thinks. Thorns carefully clipped off, of course, plus bright white chrysanthemums and three bright fuchsia hibiscus branches. Yesterday was all lilies. Her sweetheart enjoys variety. All this under her morning belt, she will eat a little spot of lunch, though a very little spot. He's warned her that heavy lunches make heavy hips, and Sophia wishes always to be his light. Afterwards, she will clean her plate and cup until they shine, make herself presentable and go about her errands on this very special day. For today, Sophia has been invited next door to Three Cedar Drive to see Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Fish and Mrs. Mink for tea. She's already wrapped up a little hostess gift for each of them. Sophia is the consummate guest, never a foot put wrong. Her husband laughs at the care she takes with such things. Such a silly little head my Sophie has on her shoulders. Stop worrying so. They love us. They all love us. We are the life of the party. You don't have to bring presents every time to everyone. You don't have to bring any presents at all. But Sophia understands in the palest cells of marrow of her bones that everything she does, from the speed of her gait to the, to the gifts she chooses, to the sway of her hair as she walks two doors down from her own, reflects upon him. And they do love him. It's so easy for her. The way Mrs. Crabbe tries to look busy hiding her blushes whenever he passes her in the garden on his way home from the office. The way Mr. Stagg fixes his hair and stands a little straighter when he ducks into their local for something cold and quiet. Sophia knows these are treasures that must be protected. She would never do the smallest thing that might risk how Mrs. Moray's dark eyes widen when her breath quicken and her breath quickens when she glimpses the two of them strolling through the market of a Saturday. Heaven forbid. She would rather die. You will never know the gentle determination of her carefulness and how it stokes and keeps the love of their neighbors. He does not need to. Sophia does not ask for praise or credit. Is he the life of the party or is she? Such questions. The party is alive. That's what matters. Well, that's deeply unsettling.
Uh, <laughs> well done. Uh, so I have some questions here that yeah. I'm going to ask you about this. We're going to talk about the book to our audience members. If you'd like to ask questions, chuck them in this chat bar. We'll throw them in here too. Uh, uh, okay. So <laughs> this is a thriller or it's yes. market like thriller, fantasy, speculative. Um, and the setting and the characters are so perfect or they think that everything is perfect. Um, dare I say Stepford esque mm. perfect can you talk about how perfection can be utilized to be so unsettling like it yeah well <laughs> i mean the thing is that like that whole first chapter and the the um hoa bylaws that come before it is deeply unsettling and yet nothing actually happens in that chapter beyond i mean maybe she's not allowed in the basement um that is actually unsettling. It's just the unquestioning perfection of it. Um, the bylaws themselves actually did a lot of research into the worst HOA uh, agreements in America, which was quite a lot of fun. Uh, most of them are in Florida. Most other countries don't do things like that. It's kind of our thing. Um, and uh, so the, the ones in the very first chapter seem almost normal and then they just kind of ramp up from there. But yeah, so, you know, the whole first, portion of it is kind of setting up um, the status quo of this world and it is deeply unsettling. Uh, I think it nearly killed me to write someone who is, is um, authentically fulfilled by this life uh, because of course it's nothing at all like me. But um, you know perfection is is inherently inhuman. Uh, so it, it in and of itself is uncanny uh, for there to be nothing wrong for everything to be in its place because anything real doesn't work like that it's true and the the deep she's so she's so placid in this chapter she accepts it all and you're just like mm -hmm. that's not right um, that's not normal <laughs> like the the stairs like why mm, um and to see somebody so just accept it and then mm -hmm. have that um is right yeah i mean yeah, like we, I mean, we talk, we've been talking about the Stepford Wives a lot. And it's kind of funny because I think that really um, we thought of that comparison fairly late in the process. And I'm not sure why it wasn't immediately the comparison, but in a lot of ways, we're kind of working backwards from the end of the Stepford Wives in that, you know, she is, she is that, she is that, uh, you know, perfect, uh, a creature perfectly made for the world in which she inhabits. Uh, and then we just sort of tear it all apart. Uh, whereas the <laughs> Stepford Wives kind of works in the other direction. It's and the Stepford Wives is terrifying. Um, yeah. I had a friend who used to watch a lot of horror and I could give him the Stepford smile and he would just absolutely <laughs> shiver because it's the emptiness. Yeah, is frightening. Um, and in, in human, it looks that's not what humans are supposed to look like that yeah. perfectly happy and humans aren't I don't want to say that humans shouldn't be happy. <laughs> but humans they're are not, not, like, not that happy, <laughs> not perfectly happy. They're not. Yeah, so no, it's, they're not you're just, something is wrong um yeah. this uh it has been a bit of a genre hop for you mm -hmm. um you your your books are all slightly strange but you've gone across <laughs> actually several several genres so mm -hmm. how has a thriller been different is the creative process different well so i i do try to do something different with each book which is a, a privilege i have to say like uh, you know, it's very easy to get typecast as a writer in, into writing one thing. And, and it was really important to me kind of after The Orphan's Tales was successful to uh, do something that wasn't a fairy tale right after that, because I didn't want to be the fairy tale girl forever for all that this book has quite a few fairy tale elements. But um, I, I, you know, as somebody, we talked a little bit before we turned the cameras on that, you know, I have severe ADHD. I cannot do the same thing twice. Uh, I do like to jump around a lot and I've kind of always wanted to write um, something like this. I grew up uh, just sort of plowing through uh, murder mysteries. Every woman in my family read them, very, you know, different loyalties to, to different writers. Um, I've read a truly gross amount of Tony Hillerman, who I do not even particularly think is a good murder mystery writer, but I read a lot of it as a kid and Christie and Sayers and, and um, you know, all, all the good ones as well. Uh, and, and horror was sort of my first love. So I've always wanted to do something kind of like this, but never really um, 
had an idea. And uh, I think that kind of the major difference is that I knew where I was going to start and where I was going to end and how I was going to get there before I put any word on the page, which is very rare for me. Uh, I usually like to keep the end or at least something in the middle kind of obscured so that I'm still invested and interested and my brain doesn't just go on break um, when I'm when I'm writing. But this one, like it, it, the idea arrived with all the bells and whistles on. I knew exactly uh, where I was headed. Um, so that's really helpful when you're constructing a mystery, which has a lot of moving parts and pieces that all have to interact correctly with each other. Because I do, uh, as, as, as someone who has consumed a lot of this media, I profoundly believe in playing fair with the audience. Uh, it should all, I, I believe, and I, I know that this is not something that every mystery writer uh, agrees with, but I believe for myself that the solution should be guessable by a clever reader. Uh, it should not be something that just comes out of left field and, oh, who's this random guy you've never heard of before? Like, that isn't satisfying to me as a, as a reader or a viewer uh, or, or, you know, the, the person on the voyeur end of this thing. And so uh, I definitely wanted to make it a puzzle that was very difficult, but at its core solvable. And you kind of need to know where you're going if, you're, if you want to do that. It is, so that was kind of the biggest difference. It's, you know, it's interesting that you like to leave breadcrumbs, uh, which is a very fairy tale mm. <laughs> symbolism there. But it's, you know, have you ever had the experience of someone uh, my husband does this and I don't want to talk about myself but he'll be like on page 20 and he's like oh it's the mirrors isn't it and I'm like how did you do that um <laughs> so do you do you ever have people do that to you with that or with my books or just like things that we're watching together or, or either together? we've we've turned well, it into a game otherwise I'd ban him from but <laughs> I feel like our husband should hang out. Uh, my <laughs> husband also likes to predict what happens uh, in anything that we're watching. Um, I definitely, uh, it, you know, when I'm when I'm watching or reading something, it actually kind of depends on how good it is, whether my brain will start trying to work it out. If it's sufficiently absorbable, I'm like absorbing, I'm willing to go along for the ride and not try to guess. Uh, but if, you know, if it gives me any moment to wander, then my brain will be like, all right, I think this guy's behind it. Um, and uh, so I, I will I will sometimes do that, but I, that's usually kind of a quiet uh, process for me. Um, yeah, I like, I do, but I do like to guess and I am pretty good at guessing. Uh, there are, but I, it's, it's also unfair for me to guess. I think part of the reason it's quiet these days is that if I'm just hanging out with my friends, I don't think that somebody who cares and knows about narrative quite as deeply as I do guessing what's going to happen next is is quite like that's not that's I'm not cheating fair. a that's little cheap. bit like that's not fair. And <laughs> that's what my husband did is he he did take some classes on narrative theory and he's like, oh, well, they're going to bring this test. I'm like, How? Whereas I'm the person on the last page who's like, oh, the butler did it. So it's yeah. but it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> Um, but I like feeling like, oh, the butler did it. Like I, I, I ruin things for myself sometimes by theorizing too much because if you theorize sufficiently, you will hit on whatever it is. There's only so many solutions to any given plot. So, you know, if I have thought of what happens before I see it, then it inherently can't be quite as surprising to me. So I do, I really like to be surprised. Like I prefer to be surprised. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to get ahead of my own <laughs> my own inclination to flip to the back of the book you know I, I never I had I don't think I've ever talked about this in an interview I used to when I was younger like I think I probably stopped around 25 26 but I used to read the last page of the book before I started it just no. the last page okay. yeah 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 uh because I like I don't know I liked something about because the, the actual last page is usually past the denouement and it, it often will not give you a real spoiler but it will give you a thread and I kind of liked that so I, that used to be the way I read every book shame shame I feel like I know right I don't do that anymore at all it seems weird to me now but I did it for my entire reading life up until I was almost 30. all right um goodness I can't even I, I love <laughs> I know, surprised, it's kind of gross so. um all right. Uh, so you mentioned that earlier that you had the idea for this story all just 
pop into your head all at once. And I wanted to ask you um, what usually comes first for you. Uh, uh, do you imagine a character? Do you imagine a story? Do you have a scene that pops into your head a moment? And um, was this one, did this one just burst fully formed from Zeus's head or? Um, yeah, so I, it really depends on the project. Uh, oftentimes it's a line. Um, it, sometimes, sometimes it's a character, often, really often it's a voice or there sometimes it's a high concept idea like your revision in space or something like that and it's wor worked back from that um this one you know as i said I, I found a piece of real folklore and mythology that i had not heard of before which is rare enough for somebody who trades in folklore and mythology uh professionally and um I kind of made a cynical joke about it to a hotel room in Poland uh, that was totally empty. It just me. And then that that joke kind of became the book. But that that first line I was made for him definitely uh, was what started it. And I knew that that was going to be the first line. I knew kind of the shape of the first chapter. Um, and I like, I don't know, my my brain was real quick on this one uh, in a way that it isn't often. Uh, but it, it, it kind of spun it all out from start to finish. I love when, when I learn this about a book, because you can see how everything starts to unpack more mm. and more and more from that line and grow. Um, so you said this was quick. This is a novella. Mm -hmm. Um, you've done several novellas, uh, yeah. now, is there something that keeps drawing you back to them versus the, the thicker, technically full length? novels well <laughs> mainly um people pay me to write them <laughs> um Valid. people ask me to uh I, I i do like the length though there's a simplicity and a leanness to it uh novels can tend to get out of hand uh in a way that that novellas um can just kind of be the sort of laser-like focus. Um, but this actually has a weirder story than that. Uh, the Pastures Red that came out earlier this year, you know, was, was commissioned by an editor as a novella. This was not, this was a short story. Uh, the same editor, Jonathan Strawn, who I've worked with a lot, um, asked me for a short story for tour.com. And I that, that moment in the Warsaw hotel room actually happened in 2017. And um, I uh, got pregnant shortly after that. And my brain uh, refused to write anything uh, while it was busy making a person. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had maternity leave and everything. And um, so then, I, you know, Jonathan asked me to write a story. And I was like, oh, well, maybe there's something in the in the apples thing, maybe I could go back to that. And I so rarely go back to ideas. If I don't write it first, and I had written about 600 words of this, uh, if I don't, but if I don't do it right away, I don't usually go back. Um, but this has been the year of going back. A uh, number of the things that I've had come out this year have been uh, things that I put aside um, before the baby and, and had went back to. So uh, I wrote this, I wrote this short story in three days in a hotel room, uh, which was now that I think about it, it was the first time that I had just been on my own since I had Sebastian, like that nobody could yell for me in the middle of the night and like nobody could demand anything of me. I didn't have to cook food or do anything. And uh, clearly I had a lot to say. Um, so it all just kind of came tumbling out and it got long. Uh, when I turned it in, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm aware that this is a polite cough short of a novella. Uh, I didn't mean that. I could have made it longer, uh, but I controlled myself. So I'm sorry, here it is. <laughs> and uh, he said, it's fine. I think we can work with the length. And I didn't hear anything for a couple of months. And then I got an email saying that the whole team at tour.com just loved it and uh felt that it was um it was too good to just uh you know throw it up on the website and hope for the best and if i if i wanted to um you know make it longer as i had said i could have uh then they would do it as a book and so i you know went back into it and uh expanded it uh, a little bit more and uh, i think as a short story it would have probably been quite overstuffed but as a novella, it's a it's a lean, mean murder machine, and uh, there is there is not a word wasted or a scene that could possibly be cut. I was asked in an interview like, "What's on the cutting room floor?" And usually there's an answer to that, but for this, there is nothing. Like there is not one deleted scene. There is not one deleted paragraph. Like this is there there isn't anything I could imagine cutting from this. 
Wow, that's very rare. I've it's very rare. I've done a lot For of me YouTube too. Interviews. Like not, yeah, that's usually you. Tr auth you hear authors talking. They're like, I need to trim thirty thousand words, which is yep. a lot. And so to not need to trim anything is astonishing. Yeah. Well, and I think that honestly, with sort of the the way that this sort of flips on its head and twists at the end, I'm not sure how much longer I could have kept that up. Uh, so I, I think this is the perfect length for this story. Excellent. Um, so it's interesting that you say that when, if you don't finish something immediately, it, it goes in a, like a drawer, it goes away. Mm. Um, and you've also mentioned you have ADHD and <laughs> we, um, we subject, we suffer from a lack of object permanence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so have you ever gone back into that drawer? And well, so I, I'll tell you what the drawer actually is. It's a Scrivener file. So every uh, year in January, I do a, uh, I open up a new Scrivener file. It says short fiction, you know, 2021. And then everything I do that's not a novel in that year goes into that file. And then all of my sort of notes or ideas for future things are in a different file within that Scrivener thing. And um, so I do go back into it. So this was going back into it. And then um, I had a novelette that came out earlier this year um, called L'Esprit d'Escalier, uh, which is an Orpheus and Eurydice re retelling. And that, good Lord, I've been trying to write that for a couple of years now, actually. Um, I think three years. And uh, I guess this was the year that that happened. And I think that there's another one, actually, that um, was one of the old ideas. So this was the year that I went back in there uh, and, and pulled out old stuff. And of course, The Passage is Red actually started uh, with a short story called The Future is Blue. That's what won the Sturgeon Award. Um, so in, in many ways, this was a year of sort of going back into that. But I think that it's a different thing when you have a kid and you kind of come out of the fog when they sort of get past two and a half and, and you know, start being a lot more independent and you get your brain back a little bit. Uh, like there's, it's worth going, going back into the mines uh, after that. Um, so we have a question from Julie. She says, mm -hmm. you're an incredible reader. You narrated your Fairyland audiobooks, but not others, including this one. This one has a different, and the audiobook mm -hmm. has a narrator who is not you. Did you not enjoy the voice work? Do you think you <laughs> might ever record again? Um, it's not that I didn't enjoy it. I do enjoy it. Uh, it was um, a lot of fun uh, to record the Fairyland books. Uh, but I do think that, um, and I like I have a I have a huge background in theater, and uh, you know I I I thank you for saying that I am a good reader. Um, you know I've I've been acting since I was about four years old, uh, and I like to think it is a skill of mine. However, I am not a professional actor, and uh, it is fun for me to hear people interpret my work. Uh, I can't really do accents very well, so like something like space opera. There's no way I can't do that. Like, first of all, although there's not an American character in that book, like I can't do that. Uh, like I, I can't, I can't do the correct accents. And if I can't do it perfectly, I don't want to do it. Um, and also uh, particularly kind of between like 2012 and uh, you know, 2018 when I had Sebastian, it was just this flurry of work in my career. And I didn't have time to get in a booth for eight hours a day and, and record, you know, some of these, like, you know, Radiance is also, and, and my husband, uh, Heath Miller recorded both Space Opera and Radiance. Like these are, these are massive books that take a lot of work and I just didn't have the time. And, and I felt like I, I wanted, you know, people who are really good at, I want to do what I'm really good at. And I want, like other people to do what they're really good at. And I love, um, you know, experiencing uh, my work interpreted through these amazing actors, including Karis Campbell, who recorded both this and, um, or narrated both this and the Refrigerated Monologues audiobook. Uh, I would never, you know, miss in a thousand years uh, the extraordinary one woman show that is Karis's Refrigerator Monologues. Um, and so I decided after I did the third Fairyland book that, um, unless I felt emotionally that it was important that I do it, uh, which I did with some of the Fairyland books, um, that, that I, would, I would rather uh, professionals um, do that so that I could write more books. Um, but I love reading and I, I still you know, read my work live quite a bit. Um, 
but yeah, uh, and you know, the Fairyland series, all the audiobooks are very much, uh, it's a family production. I did the first, third, and fifth one. Uh, my, my dear sister of my heart, S.J. Tucker, who did a number of albums based on my work, she did the second one. My husband, who was not my husband yet, but uh, he did the fourth one. So it's like, like it's definitely like a House of Valenti production. Um, but uh, I, I think that it's wonderful to um, not only have all of these different voices available to interpret the work, but, you know, um, to be able to support other people's art as well. You know, voice narration and voice acting is, uh, is an incredible art form. And um, I would rather people, people who are perfect at that get to do it. Perfect. I, I think your narrator would love to hear you call her <laughs> perfect. Um, excellent. Uh, so at this point, I will remind our audience that the Comfort Me with Apples is available from Gibson's Bookstore for pre-order. We will be sending them out as soon as we get them. And we do have signed book plates that we will be including with your purchase from Gibson's Bookstore. Um, and a reminder that if you'd like to toss a question into the chat, feel free to do so. Um, do you have, you mentioned earlier some thriller uh, authors and murder mystery authors is are there any ones that you wish you could just absorb their powers you know like eat carve out their heart and eat it and therefore <laughs> their powers uh, i mean good lord who who among us would not like to uh absorb dorothy sayers powers uh but um or stephen king's <laughs> like you know one of the uh sort of uh it's a short story um but they did make a movie out of it as they do with everything of his but um kind of i wouldn't say an inspiration but definitely an influence was a good marriage um which is about a woman discovering that her husband is a serial killer uh it's a very different story actually than than come from me with apples but i think that there's um there's sort of some kissing cousins there and i definitely wish i could absorb stephen king's power are you freaking kidding me i moved to maine like <laughs> as a writer of course of course I do uh but um you know I and I love the way that Dorothy Sayers can make you care about the mystery but also never really never drag you down into despair there's always a lightness to it um and make you care so much about the characters uh investigating it just make you care so much about the setting like uh, you care deeply in any in a, any Sayers mystery, uh, e even before you get to the murder, and and that's always something I really admired about her. It's quite a skill. Um, what is next for you? I mean, I know that you've released two books this year. So what? Yeah. What is next? Is it seems like a <laughs> presumptuous question to no, ask? No, no, there's but... a lot coming. Um, so in April, uh, I have my next middle grade fantasy coming out, which is called Osmo Unknown and the Eight Penny Woods. Uh, and then the best of Catherine and Valenti is coming out in the late summer, I think, um, which is from Subterranean Press. And it's, um, you know, uh, my, my best short fiction. I've always wanted to have a best of collection. So I'm so excited about it. Uh, and I just saw the covers and they're extraordinary and they're doing a leather bound edition too. So I get to be in leather. And uh, <laughs> they put like a little ribbon. Can you ask yeah, yeah, for like, yeah. the ribbon? The thing. Yeah. I know. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, and then I, um, I, there is another thing coming out at the end of next year that uh, uh, we, uh, has not been announced yet. Uh, so I can't say, but everyone will be very, everyone who is a fan of mine is going to be super excited about it. Um, and then I'm, right, what I'm finishing up uh, right now is uh, the sequel to Space Opera, which is called Space Oddity. So um, there'll be a lot coming out. That's so that's three next year or that's three three next year four? and then it's three next year and then um, hopefully two in 2023 and then we'll see how everything goes as I close out the uh, contracts that were all due when I got pregnant. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of what's going on and then uh, all, all the all the new stuff. So yeah, um, we're, we're pretty locked in for the next few years. So you must be exhausted. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am yeah, all the yeah. time. <laughs> it's, it's a given. All right. So uh, as I guess some of my final questions here, um, normally I end with asking, what have your characters, have they taught you anything? Um, I'm not certain you want to learn something <laughs> from these characters. I mean, uh, always go in the basement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
don't wait just go <laughs> just go maybe just a lot of time you know I feel um, like life life yeah. advice there just, just <laughs> check the closets check the basement yeah. <laughs> um I think Sophia is um she is a really endearing sweet character she's a genuinely sweet um person who is just not in control of what is happening to her and uh not like you know she's she, the whole story is sort of her journey towards agency <clears throat> and um you know whether or not that agency will be punished uh and i think that all of our lives are kind of a journey towards agency uh as i raise a toddler i i noticed that happening um and uh and i certainly you know learn from her to not to not wait uh, to and and hope that things will reveal themselves. Um, but yeah, like my, my characters, they're always <laughs> they're always fucking about. Uh, they're always, they're always messing with things they shouldn't, and you know it usually turns out uh, that they that somebody should have, and it just had to be them. So I guess just mess with things is what I learned from them. Don't wait. Don't close your eyes. Just, just check. Just check. Yeah. Just, just check. Um, well, thank you for joining us this evening as Queen of Crows. Yes. Uh, just for the job that you want. I prefer Space Queen, you know, like full glitter, purple. You got the feathers. I love it. Um, thank you. Uh, come well, for actually, uh, uh, allow me to be cool for one second here. We can, we can do Space Queen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes oh this that was, just, that was sitting on top of a stormtrooper head up there so i can pull that down <laughs> i've got a crown up there without a frame but uh i don't know I how wore to get this that. to the I, I wore this to the hugos when space opera was nominated it's a replica of what uh kate miller heidecke wore in eurovision 2019 in her amazing uh space opera song uh zero gravity so I can do space queen. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you just need to wear that grocery shopping. Just lean. Yes, absolutely. Lean into it. Hey, on my tiny island, my <laughs> island grocery store run by a guy named Bob. You can like put an <laughs> apple on each spike and then you have. At the, at the post you go cocktail reception, we put cocktail weenies on them. I feel like you and I would be friends. Um, we'll we'll set we'll leave the husbands uh, to, yeah. to watch movies and guess the endings, um, and then we will wear crowns grocery shopping. It's a date. perfect. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Comfort me with apples is available for pre-order from Gibson's Bookstore coming out very soon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us from yeah, a tiny thanks, island. Thanks everybody. Have a Bye. great night.